All right, am I good to start? All right, hi everyone. So it's such an enthusiastic crowd. How's everyone doing? I like you, you're, you're participating. Um, so uh, today I'm here to talk to you about um, kind of modern security practices and codifying security. Um, so my name is Seth, I'm a developer advocate at Google Cloud. Um, you might recognize me from the HashiCorp community or the Chef community where I worked previously. Um, and to start today, there's like some slides in the beginning and then most of it's like live demo, so that's exciting. Um, but first I wanna talk about traditional security. Um, so this is how I describe traditional security. Uh, it's a padlock around a keyboard. Um, and, and let's think about this in terms of like an application architecture. So if we look back maybe 10 or 15 years ago, our applications tend to, tended to be structured something like this. Um, you had some load balancer that would do the network ingress, that would hit some firewall, those might have been the same thing, um, and then you would hit your secure domain. Um, and um, the application was likely monolithic, so you didn't have microservices, all communication happened with inside the application, um, and your, your database and your application lived on the same network. They might have been connected by the same physical, like serial cable connecting these two machines. Um, the load balancer and the firewall were likely hardware appliances, like an F5, um, and all of this was controlled by like one or two people who had a lot of skills in the industry. So the important part to note here is that once we're inside the secure zone, everything was trusted. When we move to like a modern architecture of an application, um, applications have gotten increasingly more complex. This is due to new programming languages, new requirements, uh, proliferations of things like microservices so we can break apart uh, different things uh, so that different teams can work on different things and accelerate application delivery, but that introduced some complexity. So now we have cloud adoption where we have some things running on a public cloud, some things running on a private cloud, uh, some things running in both at the same time and they need to talk to each other. So our modern architectures tend to look something like this. We still have a load balancer, but that load balancer is likely a software defined load balancer. Um, so not only are we eating some performance, but we're now subject to any vulnerabilities that exist in that language. So if that load balancer is written in C and there's a memory leak, like oops, um, as opposed to something like an FPGA, which is a hardware based load balancer. We no longer have a firewall. Instead, we have firewall rules. Again,
service that's like TLS, right? We're encrypting the connection, we're encrypting the data over that connection, but we need to encrypt our data at rest as well. So in transit and at rest. On this, at the same time, we need to understand the trade-offs of encrypting that data. Um, there's certain data that should be encrypted and there's certain data that can live in plain text. Uh, if you imagine we have a database of things like email addresses, um, you might think, oh, I'm gonna encrypt those email addresses because if I get attacked, um, you know, I'm gonna be on the front page of Hacker News, I'm gonna be on Troy Hunt's Have I Been Phoned? Um, and that's a very valid way of thinking. And this is where there is no one answer. If I'm a company like MailChimp, where my core business is sending email, email addresses are very important. If I get hacked and I see that there's been a data leak, that's basically the end of my business. On the flip side, if my primary business is cat memes, um, and I run the top site for cat memes, and I collect email addresses so I can send out a newsletter. If I'm attacked, it's bad. I shouldn't have done that. I should have followed better security practices, but it's not the end of my business. And at the same time, if I encrypt all of my email addresses in my database, I lose the ability to do analytics. Uh, I can't search for all email addresses that end in, say, at gmail.com anymore, because they're all encrypted. So I have to make a business decision of should I encrypt this data, should I not encrypt the data. So encryption everywhere isn't the answer. Instead, having a cognitive conversation about whether we should encrypt data everywhere is the answer. And making a business decision and analyzing that risk of whether we should encrypt, uh, should encrypt or not encrypt and what the business trade-offs are for that. The second pillar are these uh, dynamic, time-based, revocable credentials. So in a traditional application development, you might have an app that has to talk to a database. And the way you generally get the credential is you email your DBA team or you file a ticket, they manually provision an account for you, they give it back to you, you put it in the config file for the application, and all of your applications share that same credential seemingly for the end of time. Um, if you're in a large enterprise, uh, you might rotate them every six months. Um, if you're a startup, you keep them there until you get acquired. This is a challenge. The longer a credential lives, the more likely it will be hacked. So instead of trying to do this whole, uh, no, no one's ever gonna infiltrate our systems, we're gonna have the best security <laughs> perimeters, we can instead invert the conversation and say, you know what, if someone makes it into our systems, that sucks, we should do better, but our credentials only live for an hour. So at most, an attacker would have to penetrate these three levels, then get in a credential and use it within an hour. And we can revoke it early. And this is why time-based credentials are very important. I'll say this, I said this on the encryption side, and I'll say it here again, unified APIs and codified best practices. This is arguably the most important concept, and, and what I'm gonna show you in a bit with uh, Vault, which is an open source tool, is we need a central source for secrets. Many organizations out there are writing code in five different programming languages with hundreds of engineers, all with different levels of expertise. We can't expect every Ruby developer, every Java developer, every Go developer, every C developer to reinvent encryption. Instead, we should treat encryption the same way we treat things like databases. They're just a service that is offered. So just like a database is a service that is offered to store data and retrieve data and search data, we should, we should think of security as the same way. There needs to be a service that does security for us. So things like encryption as a service, password generation, entropy generation, Right? I shouldn't have to write that in my own language. It would be great if I could just make an API call over, say, you know, SSL with uh, a JSON payload and say, hey, give me 150 bits of random entropy. And I don't want to have to write that in five languages. I would love to just make an API call. And that's kind of the direction that I think security should be going, is security as a service. <laughs> if I want to encrypt something, I don't want to have to pick a cipher suite. I don't want to have to know if it should be symmetric or asymmetric encryption. I just want to, I have this blob of text, and I want someone else to encrypt it for me with the latest and greatest standards and give me back the encrypted text. And I don't want to have to think about it, I, want to, I don't want to have to know, you know all of the vulnerabilities that exist. And again, this is the direction that I think the security industry is going. And to do that, we need a consistent experience. So it doesn't matter what language you're writing in, it doesn't matter if you're a human or a computer or a service, it doesn't matter if you're an enterprise or a startup, it doesn't matter if you're running on Kubernetes or Mesos or bare metal, we need a consistent experience. And that's really what Vault tries to be. Um, so Vault is an open source tool written in Go. Uh, it runs as a service and it's designed to be the central repository and central egress and ingress for all credentials within a system. So 
I'm going to demo it while continuing to talk about it. Um, I have this live demo slide, so I couldn't get my way out of it. Um, so let me just show you kind of how this works. So Vault operates in a client-server architecture. Everyone see this? You're also loud. There we go. All right, so um, Vault operates in a client server architecture. Um, what I have done here is I'm going to start a Vault server. Um, and I created scripts because I suck at typing. So I'm starting a Vault server. Um, that's exciting. It's running as a service in the background. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open a new tab over here. So I have Vault running. It's running as a service. If I was in production, it would run in high availability mode. But for locally, I just have one instance. And I just make requests against Vault. It, act, it acts just like a database, where it has data. Um, but we'll see in a little bit that it's a little bit more than that. So just to prove to you that I have a Vault server up and running, there's a Vault server. I just queried for its status. Vault is conceptually similar to a, a website. Um, you have to log in to Vault or authenticate to Vault. There's a number of ways you can authenticate. You can authenticate via a username and password. You can authenticate via a GitHub token. You can authenticate via LDAP, uh, service accounts, et cetera. Um, the easiest way to think about it is when you log into a website, you put in a username and a password. The username and password is validated against a backend database. And then you get a session token or a session ID. And that's stored in a cookie in your browser. Um, in Vault, the concept of a session ID is called a Vault token. Um, so I'm just going to log into Vault here. Um, and I'm now authenticated to Vault. And I've logged in as the root account, which is a really bad practice, but this is a demo, so I'm doing it anyway. Um, and this is just going to kind of showcase, it gives me super permissions in the system. So the first uh, kind of component of Vault, and the easiest one to think about with encryption, uh, is this what we call the static key value store. The easiest way to think about this is like encrypted Redis or encrypted memcache. I'm going to give Vault some plain text data. Vault is going to encrypt that data in transit with TLS and at risk with, AE, at rest with AES 256-bit encryption, and it's going to store it. When I want it back, I ask Vault for the data back. Vault decrypts it and gives me back the plain text data. So it's going to behave similar to like Redis or Memcache, but it's encrypted in transit and at rest. So I do that by writing to anything under secret. So I'm going to create a secret named Wi-Fi. Wow, I can't type. And I'm going to say that the password is, I don't know, what is the Wi-Fi password? I'm not typing that out. The password is bananas. Uh, so I've created this credential. And I can read that credential back out. And I get that my password is bananas. And I can create any number of these uh, secrets. So I might have the, I don't know, the bathroom door code. Um, and it might be. One, two, three, four. And I can actually list these now. And I can see I have two credentials, the bathroom credential and the, the Wi-Fi credential. And this is nothing special. <laughs> this is just I gave Vault some data. It encrypted it. It stored it. I want it back. I get it back. That whole process is authenticated, though. So I'm cheating a little bit here. I'm the root account, which is kind of like sudo in Linux. So I can do anything on the system. Um, but everything in Vault is actually policy-based. And if you don't have permission, you, you can't do it. So I could create a policy which lets me read the Wi-Fi password, but not the bathroom code. So work all you want, no breaks for you. Someone got that joke. Um, so uh, this is basic CRUD operation. Uh, so the last thing you can do, uh, obviously, is to delete things. So I'll go ahead and delete the bathroom code. And I've now deleted that credential. So basic CRUD operations on a k-value store it doesn't feel encrypted, right? How many people feel extra secure using this over something like Redis? Yeah, it, it doesn't actually feel secure. Um, and I want to talk about that for a second. So the reason for this is that the security industry has kind of preconditioned us to believe that security has to be hard. Um, and part of this is vendors trying to sell their appliances. And, and part of this is just security was hard for a very long time. Um, Vault is open source. It's been audited, I think, six times now um, by three different groups, including the NCC group, which is like a leading auditing firm in the security uh, and compliance area. 
It's FIPS 140-2 compliant. Uh, it can be PCI compliant if you follow the correct steps for implementation. So it, it checks all of the boxes, all of the multi-letter acronyms that you're used to with security and compliance, yet we don't feel secure. Um, and that's, that's part of the industry's thing and part of the thing I'm setting out to change is that security doesn't have to be hard. Um, this is a tool that is validated. It is used by government agencies in the world, um, so it passes all the checks. But this isn't where Vault is cool. Um, I could build this um, backed by something like Redis or Memcached in an afternoon. So this is just one feature of Vault. Another feature of Vault and where it really shines is this notion of dynamic credentials. So here, when we're using the key value store, I give Vault data, Vault encrypts it and stores it. But what if I have a really large data set? Uh, maybe I have a database with 100 million users in it and I want to encrypt their passwords or their social security or, or credit card numbers. Um, I, I don't want to store that in Vault. Uh, that's a lot of data and Vault isn't a database, right? It, it shouldn't be used for thing, you know, replication and sharding, right? That's a database's responsibility. But I still want to encrypt the data. So what we can use, we can use what's called the transit backend. So instead of Vault encrypting and storing the data, Vault will encrypt and return the data to me. And then it's my responsibility to persist that in my application. So I'll go ahead and show you how that works. Um, everything in Vault is uh, like a file system. So I'm gonna go ahead and enable the transit uh, backend, as we call it, and then I'm gonna create an encryption key. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this. Uh, set up transit. And now I have this transit backend and I have an encryption key named my app. So what I can do is I can encrypt, transit encrypt my app. I can encrypt some plain text data. Um, and that data has to be Base64 encoded, uh, which I'll explain in a second. And I will say FOSS Asia. So I've encrypted this. What happened was I sent some plain text data to Vault. Vault encrypted it using a cipher suite and returned me this encrypted text. This is also available via the API. Actually, everything I do via the CLI is available via the API. The CLI is just a very thin wrapper around the API. So you could do this in Ruby or Python or Java or with curl if you would like. I take this cipher text, this whole block of text, including the Vault V1, and I store that in my database. When I want the plain text back, I take this entire cipher text and I give it back to Vault, but I use the decrypt endpoint, <laughs> slash my app, and I give it the cipher text, and Vault gives me back the plain text. Um, and this is Base64 encoded, so if we echo this, Base64 encode, we'll get Fossation. So, the reason that we use Base64 encoding is that there's actually no requirement that the data that you're persisting to Vault is representable as ASCII characters. Um, PDF, Word document, right? All of those are things that I should be able to encrypt, but uh, under the hood, this is a JSON payload over uh, HTTP over TLS. And in order to safely transmit those binary bits, I need a, a transport mechanism, and Base64 is one of the most common. Um, so if you are encrypting kind of large blobs of data, you base64 encode them, they get sent along with the payload, they come back as a, a, a binary safe string so you can store them in a database and then retrieve them later. So this is a great way to provide encryption as a service. Um, and what's nice is there's a number of different uh, features of this. So <laughs> it's not just an encryption key, it's actually an encryption key ring. So I can maintain multiple versions, I can upgrade and downgrade my encryption keys to make sure that I'm always using the latest data and my data is always encrypted with a fresh key. Um, I have you know, third party processes that can re-encrypt data. I can have my front end servers uh, with the permission to encrypt data but not decrypt it. And I can have my back end servers the ability to decrypt data but not encrypt it. This would let me have a front end application that could accept credit card applications. It would encrypt, encrypt the you know, social security number and the credit card number, put it in the database, but it could never decrypt it. So even if an attacker gained access to my front end server, they had root access on my front end server, that server is not authorized to decrypt data. So they couldn't actually decrypt it because they have to also compromise Vault in that scenario. So it's a multifaceted attack. Similarly, my back end servers can only decrypt data. If an attacker is able to compromise that service, they can get their credit card numbers, but they can't persist any bad data or any fraudulent data into my system because they can't perform the encryption operation. 
So this is uh, kind of leading into what in Vault we call dynamic credentials. Um, dynamic credentials are things that are created on the fly. So one of the easiest ways to think about dynamic credentials is in terms of databases. Right now, in order to create a database password, you have to like run some SQL commands or click and agree. You get back a username and password, you put it in a text file, and you share it across all your applications. There's a number of problems with this. Namely, you have one shared credential, so if it's hacked, you have to take, incur downtime to rotate those credentials. Uh, you don't have provenance, which is a one-to-one -one mapping of an application to its credentials. Um, and it's not good for auditing and logging. Right? You can't do this um, dissection or diagnosis of a problem. So what we can do in Vault, <coughs> Uh, oops, I ran that before I actually showed you what it was. Is Vault can actually connect to a database like Postgres or MySQL or HANA or Oracle, um, and it can actually dynamically create these credentials. So I'm running a local host here because um, I, I didn't want to rely on the internet, but uh, last night at the meetup I demoed using this on Cloud SQL, uh, so a third party database service. What I do is I give Vault uh, root or privileged credentials to my database, and I give it um, a series of SQL commands to run to create a user. So here I say create role with uh, login password valid until, and these curly brace things get filled in by Vault. So what will happen is when I make an API request to Vault, Vault will establish a connection to Postgres, it will run this SQL filling in the things between the curly braces and give me back a user. So what we've done and what Vault does is it actually provides an HTTP API for programmatically generating SQL users. And this works with Microsoft SQL, Oracle, a lot of mainstream databases out there. Um, you can run any SQL statement. So if you have a stored procedure or if you want to grant privileges on a number of different things, it's just an SQL statement. <clears throat> so I've, I already set that up. And you'll notice here that I've created a role. A role named read only is like a symlink. So when I want credentials, I ask Vault, hey, give me the credentials that correspond to the SQL, the, the SQL statement. And the way I do that is by referencing the role. So I would run something like vault read. Uh, actually, before I do that, let me prove something to you. Um, so this is my local SQL instance. Um, you can see there's one user in there. That's me. I'm the root user. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to read from database creds read only. This is going to generate credentials. So when I hit enter, Vault actually establishes a connection to my local Postgres cluster, generates a username and password, and fills it in between those curly braces, executes that SQL, and returns the result to me. So here you'll see we got a username and a password back. This is a real Postgres username and a real Postgres password. And every time I run this command, I'll get a new username and password. So you can see here that they're, they're different. This is useful because all my app has to do is, at boot time, make a request to Vault. If it's authorized and authenticated to do that, it'll get back its own unique credential. So that one application has a unique credential to talk to my database. You'll notice that, that the database credential has a least duration of 768 hours. It's about a day. Um, or, sorry, about a month. Um, it's a long day. It's a day on Mars. It's a day on Jupiter? Yeah, it's about a day on Jupiter. Um, that's about 30 days. So what will happen is after 30 days, this credential will get revoked automatically. So we don't have to worry about rotation and stuff because we can tell our auditors and our compliance teams, hey, this no credential lives longer than 30 days. I could set that to as little as five minutes if I really wanted to. And then no credential would live longer than five minutes. So to prove this to you, I'll go back here, PSQL, I'll list the users, and you'll see we have two users in here now. So we programmatically, and again, under the hood, this is just an API call. We now have an HTTP API that can generate database users. This is incredibly powerful. And those users have a limited time that they live. They can live for a configurable amount of time, anywhere from one second all the way up to five or 10 years. But we're able to time scope these. We're auto we can revoke them in advance as well. So right now, I just showed you all my username and password to my database. That probably wasn't a good idea. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and run vault revoke. And I'm going to revoke all of the database credentials. And just like that, when I go in here, they're all gone. So that's what we call a break glass procedure, which is, oh no, I've been hacked. 
I need to like stop the pleading. I'm gonna incur downtime, but that's better than losing customer data. I'm gonna delete all of my credentials and I'm gonna start from scratch and re-diagnose this problem so that we can find where the, the, the vulnerability or the infiltration happened. Um, that's how easy it is to revoke these credentials and you can do it on a subset, you can do it on a full set, you can revoke everything in vault. Now that requires a lot of privilege. Not every user can do that. Again, I'm the root user, so I have kind of exponential privilege in the system. But if you do that, you lose the uh, if you do this, you don't lose tracing because the uh, the username and the lease ID are available in an audit log, which is stored separately. Typically, you put that into something like Splunk or some third-party system, so you can still correlate with the logs. Uh, how many people here run their own certificate authority? <laughs> no, you don't like to self-deprecate. Um, so, one of the cool features about Vault with these dynamic secrets, and uh, one of the challenges with microservices, especially a lot of them, is you either need some kind of service mesh with something like Istio and Envoy to manage mutual authentication and authorization in the cluster, or you have to manage your own PKI infrastructure. Um, and Vault actually makes that second one easier. So for customers that can't adopt tools like that or aren't ready to make the step to a service mesh, your own internal PKI infrastructure is very helpful. Um, so here what I'm doing is I'm uh, generating a root certificate, I could give Vault my own certificate if I wanted, and then I'm generating um, a, a role called my website where I can actually generate uh, <coughs> TLS certificates on the fly. Um, so if you're not familiar with PKI infrastructure, don't worry about like the curl distribution points and stuff. All you need to know is this is really hard and often involves lots of stack overflow, um, copying and pasting, and then eventually someone figures it out and puts it in a text file. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I will configure this, so set up PKI, and now what I can do is I can just generate a certificate on the fly. So what I did here is I wrote, uh, I asked Walt to issue me a certificate for example.com, and that was authorized and authenticated, so I got back the certificate, I get back the public CA chain and the, the private certificate as well, so there's the issuing CA, and here's my private key. And again, all of this is happening via an API. So there are tools out there that actually do this entirely in memory. So web servers that query Vault for their TLS certificate and only store it in memory. So even if the system is compromised, someone would have to trigger a core dump to get the private key out of these web servers. Um, and again, this is an API under the hood, so you can automate this in any language you'd like. Um, again, every time I run this command, I'll get a new certificate, and I can revoke the certificates early. So this certificate, I think, is valid for 30 days, but if all of a sudden I detect an intrusion, I don't trust my application anymore, I can revoke it early, and it can no longer talk within my systems because I'm using mutual TLS, for example. Um, this next one's kind of fun, um, but it has a real use case. Uh, so how many people know what TOTP is? Yeah, so TOTP is the generic algorithm for one-time passwords, uh, or passphrases. Um, Multi-factor authentication, those six or eight digit codes you get with like Google Authenticator or Authy, um, it's a spec. Vault uh, can actually act as a TOTP provider <coughs> and a TOTP reader. So what's a good use case for this? Um, remember, everything in Vault is authenticated and logged, and the challenge with multi-factor authentication on something like an AWS root account is that it belongs to a phone or a device. So if you run an operations team, how do you get multiple people access to that MFA code? Uh, do you pass around an RSA secure ID token to people who are on call? Um, Vault is actually a really good solution for that. So you actually store the generation in Vault and then you authorize and authenticate that and you can write Vault policies against third party systems. So you can actually say people can only generate the TOTP code if they're on call and link that into something like PagerDuty. This means that even if you're in the operations group, you can't actually log into the AWS root account unless you're currently the Enoch. So I'll go ahead and show you this. I just have a, a sample one here. And now what I can do is I can well, read TOTP code demo, and I get back my six-digit code. Um, so you know, you're used to like scanning those barcodes. Those barcodes actually correspond to a URL, and you can do that here. After about 30 seconds, this code will rotate, and I'll get a new code. So this is the same as like Google Authenticator or Authy or you know one password doing the cycling, but it's authenticated and audited. If I don't have permission to read this TOTP code, I get permission to not. Uh, Vault can also act 
as a TOTP provider. So if you have an application and you want to add two-factor authentication to your application, you can either implement the entire TOTP spec yourself and hope you get it right, including recovery codes and you know, backups and falling over to SMS, or you can use something like TOTP as a service. This goes back to kind of Vault's core mantra of security shouldn't be this hard. We're going to give it to you as an API and do the best practices for you. So instead of acting as the thing that generates codes, Vault can actually act as the thing that validates codes, which is a TOTP provider. So I'll show you how that works. Cat set up TOTP provider. Um, <clears throat> so here I'm generating, uh, I use the generate equals true keyword, but it's the same, uh, what we call a backend or the same generator. So I will run set up TOTP, TOTP provider. And I get back a bunch of text here. Um, this is kind of fun. This first box of text is a barcode. This is a base 64 encoded image of a barcode that you could have your user scan with their mobile application. The second one is the actual OTP auth URL, which is encoded in this barcode. So I will, I will attempt to remember the command to do this. Um, so I'm going to copy this to my clipboard. I think it's base64 dash dash to code, that long string of things, and we'll save that as a PNG file. Long typing. Long typing. Yeah. All right, and then we'll open this guy. And it popped up on the other screen, but I promise it's real. Oh, I'm full screen. Dang it. There you go. So you can scan this with your app, and it'll generate codes, and then you can submit those codes to Vault, and Vault will validate them. So again, it's not hard if you follow the TOT spec to build this yourself. But the idea is, and Vault's kind of mantra is, if we want teams to do security, if we want teams to do security well, we have to make it easy. And there's nothing easier than an API that does the best practices for you. So the last thing I want to show about Vault is its pluggable nature. So in addition to all of the built-in things, um, there might be something in Vault that I need to customize. I might run some custom fork of MySQL that doesn't integrate, or I might have some crazy engine that I want to integrate with myself. And I can do that with um, plugins. And Vault has this really verbose plugin interface um, with a way to trust cryptographically secure plugins. So I'm going to go ahead and install a plugin here that I wrote. What this plugin does is it allows me to generate random passwords or passphrases. Um, this is really useful if you've ever used something like 1Password or LastPass, where you can generate logins for websites. Uh, but I want something that's cryptographically secure, uh, truly random, and I might want to be able to use like the Diceware algorithm so that I can generate dictionary uh, or human readable things, and I want to do things like include symbols or include letters and numbers. This isn't something that's included with Vault by default. This is a third party plugin, but I just imported it. So let's say I want a password. I can ask Vault to generate me a password. Gen, in this case, actually maps to a plugin which I just installed. So Vault generated me a password. I think it's 64 characters in length. It includes letters, numbers, and symbols. Um, this is great. I could use that on any website that doesn't suck and uh, it would work great. But there are websites out there that suck, right? How many people have ever put a password in and it's like, no, you can't be more than 12 characters and all the letters must be five, um, right? It happens. And for those cases, you can customize that. So um, I might want to say the length is, I don't know, 36 characters because that's an arbitrary limit that someone imposed and there can be you know, up to 10 digits, but we can't do symbols. So this will give me a 36 character string, um, which is, you know, compliant with the specification. And just like the other credentials we saw, every time I run this command, I'll get a new password. This is cool. Um, again, this isn't something that's bundled with Vault. This is something that I built in an afternoon to show as a demo. Um, but I also use it for generating passwords. It also generates passphrases. Um, oops, passphrase. So um, you might have seen these before. This is a part of an algorithm called Diceware. 
um, short and trench monogamy expert polygraph rambo. Um, so this will generate six random words um, and put them together. This is actually uh, the, what is it, horse staple battery something, the XKCD, right? It's actually cryptographically more secure than the other passwords I showed you, uh, but this is way easier to type, uh, especially when it's like Netflix on your Apple TV and you're like scrolling to try to type in all these weird characters. Um, again, just like the other one, we can, you know, customize the number of words. So I can say words equals three. Now I've got three words and I can customize the separator that exists between them. Um, this one's actually just really fun to play with. Um, <laughs> like sometimes you get some really weird things. Um, like the treadmill greedy snooze sandstorm showman pregnant. I like to make up stories about them. Um, <laughs> if you are into crypto though, um, totally unrelated to this talk, I would encourage you to look up the diceware algorithm. Um, it's really cool, uh, dictionary-based attack. The problem is the computers are really bad at random number generation. So what the dice or algorithm does is you roll a die. So you generate a number between zero and, or between one and six. Um, and you do that five or six times. And then that corresponds, like you, you truncate those digits together. So like one, three, four, two, six. That corresponds to the 12,476th entry in a dictionary, which becomes one of those words. Um, it's really cool, uh, there's a white paper on it, you should look it up. Um, that's that, I'm gonna go back to like my last two slides. Um, so if you're curious about any of this, but you're like, I need a place to do this, um, Google Cloud is giving you $3,000 in this check on a slide that you should take a picture of. Um, hint, hint, you should take a picture of this slide. Um, so if you work for a startup that's qualified, um, you can visit this URL down here or just email cloudstartups at google.com. Um, $3,000 in cloud credit. You can play with Vault all that you want, as well as a ton of other features of Google Cloud. Uh, there's no reason you shouldn't do it. I will wait for more pictures to be taken. You can also just write down this thing. That's the, the important part. But this is a pretty slide, so you should take a picture of it. All right, cool. That's all I have for you. Thank you very much. Again, my name is Seth. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, and I'll be here the rest of the conference. Cool. Um, any questions still for Seth? All right. How about that? Do it. Oh, you want to try or Hi. Do you do you know of anybody using Vault for managing SSH secrets? Yes, so there's a, there's a number of what we call secrets engines, which I didn't discuss. There's about 12 of them. SSH is one of them. So Vault can actually act as um, the thing that sits in the middle. So you install a Vault agent or a Vault helper um, on the system, and whenever you try to authenticate, your authentication actually goes to Vault. Vault generates a dynamic credential, dynamic SSH key, and logs you in. Uh, it's also possible to do that via like trusted CA certificates, where uh, you have OpenSSH OpenSS Trust Vault CA, and then Vault will sign um, that CA chain. Um, I have a chart that shows how that works, but there are a number of people doing it. Um, the My problem with that is uh, if you're truly trying to do security well, no one should access a system after it's online, especially via SSH. So if there's a reason that an operator needs to touch a system like that, that's, in my opinion, a fault of logging, monitoring, like we should be able to egress that data through third party systems. There's no reason an operator should have to touch that system. If in fact that does happen though, that system should immediately be taken offline. So if I'm an operator and I need to debug an issue and I do use something like Vault SSH to access that system, that system should be removed from production immediately upon debugging so that it, it wasn't tainted because we can no longer trust it. Thanks. Yeah, just a simple question about the uh, the concept that you've shared around using Bob to issue passwords to the application to connect to the database and, and short-lift uh, username and passwords. Uh, how do you handle the expiry and the rotation of that? Yeah, so the question is, um, if I have these dynamic credentials, what happens when they expire? Yes. Um, that's application dependent, and there's a few strategies. So if you're Building a cloud native application, it likely responds to some type of signal to reload, right? SigHub or a graceful restart where it can hot reload its configuration. In those situations, you can use uh, what we call sidecar applications. 
that like end console and console template that will present the credentials that Vault has as environment variables or a file on disk. And when those chain credentials change or are about to change, you signal the application uh, to reload its configuration. In the case of a non-cloud native application, like a Java app that takes four years to boot, um, typically it's, it's hard. Um, typically what we see in those scenarios is we adopt Vault for the greenfield applications that can be cloud native and can adapt to these highly um, elastic environments. And then for the Java app, we just create a credential that's valid for a year. We still do it in Vault so we can revoke it early, but it's still a manual process until someone can update that application or we can deprecate it. Thanks. I previously used these UB keys. Does Vault have any native support or plugin support for UB keys? So, kind of. Um, so, I used to work at HashiCorp. Uh, oh, okay. There was, uh, I was employee number four at HashiCorp, so I was there quite a while. Um, yes and no. So, the open source version of Vault does not have support for things like HSMs, which is a derivative of what you're talking about, like a UB key. Um, that's part of the enterprise play. So, customers that want um, hardware generated entropy can actually connect Vault to an HSM, which could be a YubiKey or it could be some kind of appliance that generates entropy, um, and that's a paid product. So it's not available in the open source, but it is a feature that exists. Okay, yeah, we're good. Cool, so Seth, thanks very much. Thank you. Um, so great, uh, I think we covered a lot here. Quick announcement that we're gonna have a group photo, this year's group photo today, uh, at 12.15, and so if I can just ask everybody to go down to uh, level one and to the exhibition area. So we're just rounding up outside there by the exhibition area. Okay, thanks all. Thanks.